All right, welcome everybody. Nice to see you all tonight. Um, welcome to everybody on Zoom that's joining our program tonight uh, at the University of Chicago UN campus here in Hong Kong. My name is Mark Barnico. I'm the executive director of the campus here. And this is our actually our second talk on trams, the tramways, uh, with Professor Ken Pomerantz. Um, if audience members on Zoom have any questions, you can click the, uh, the Q&A button on Zoom and submit your questions on Zoom to our uh, staff, and then they'll send them to me, and I can ask Ken on, the, on behalf of the Zoom audience. And then people, obviously, in, uh, in person here uh, will have the Q&A live. So uh, I just want to remind everybody, if you're interested in our events, uh, to please sign up for our e-news at uh, www.uchicago.hk. Uh, where you can see all of the latest events that are going on on campus. Tonight, I'm delighted that we have our uh, UChicago UN campus Hong Kong faculty director, Ken Pomerantz, uh, here this evening to uh, host the talk on the webs beneath the tracks, uh, digging up the history of Hong Kong tramways. Um, Ken was uh, uh, instrumental in putting on the exhibit that maybe some of you saw today. Uh, with the team here on campus, and uh, he's going to talk about some of that research that he did. Uh, Professor Pomerantz is the faculty director of the campus here, as I just mentioned. He's also a distinguished university professor of modern Chinese and in the college. And his work focuses mostly on China, although he's interested in the comparative and the intersections uh, in world history. Most of his research focuses on so social, economic, environmental history, but he's also done work in state formation, imperialism, religion, gender, and other topics. Did anybody bring his book tonight to get signed? Anybody? Any of his books? Anyway, he's really uh, one of the pre preeminent scholars in modern China, and he's known for having written the book, The Great Divergence, China, Europe, and the Making of the Modern World Economy which won a John Fairbank, Fairbank Prize from the AHA and shared the World History Association Book Prize. He also wrote The Making of a Hinterland, State, Society, and Economy in Inland North China, 1853 to 1937, which also won a Fairbank Prize. So uh, I encourage you to um, pick up his book and, and check out his scholarly work. Um, to those of you who have visited the Tram Tales, 120 Years of Hong Kong Tramways Exhibition. As I said, uh, Professor Pomerantz will talk this evening about a very different side of the story of the Hong Kong Tramways um, in the following hour or upcoming hour. Um, in his research on this exhibit in particular, uh, he explored the history of the investors, the workers, sustainability of the tramways, marketing, real estate, tourism, strike, and even boycotts. Um, this is an iconic uh, Hong Kong tram, which I'm sure you'll be intrigued to learn more about from Professor Pomerantz. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Pomerantz to give a talk on the Hong Kong tram. Thanks very much, Mark. And thank you, everybody who's here and everybody who is not here but is on Zoom. Um, I don't want this talk to repeat too much of what is in our exhibit, since I hope many of you either already have or will visit it. But I also don't want to ignore highlights of the tram's history, many of which are in the exhibit. So as a sort of compromise, this talk will emphasize, on the one hand, some of the supplementary material that's accessible through QR codes, but not directly visible in the exhibit, some alternative interpretations of the events we describe, and it'll add some reflections on how we put the exhibit together and how it was shaped by, frankly, the luck of what materials we could and couldn't access. One thing I won't talk about much is the experience of ridership and how that changed the city by, for instance, making leisure destinations accessible to far more people than it had been before. But I'm happy to discuss any and all of that questions and answers. In most histories of a business, the business's own archives are the major source. But in this case, those records were unavailable. The company simply doesn't have most of them. And for the history of a business carrying out a public function, like transportation, you would usually rely heavily on government records. 
We did use some government archives, both in Hong Kong and in London. But a lot of that material is also missing. When the British left Hong Kong, they took a lot of government documents with them and were supposed to put them in the British National Archives. But many never made it. Um, the best estimate is that roughly 8 million pages of documents related to British government in Hong Kong that should be in the, are now actually sitting in a basement in the old foreign office. Um, the, actually, there was a lawsuit in the UK about 10 years ago after which the government agreed to make that material available. But unfortunately, the agreement after the lawsuit didn't say when they had to make it available. So all bets are, all bets are being taken. Now, this means that, for instance, we don't know why the tramways company's many proposals to expand its service area, made over several decades, were almost all rejected. So that would be an interesting story. I hope someday somebody will tell it. We had to focus differently, emphasizing, excuse me, the tramway's relationship with people, institutions, and cultural trends in Hong Kong and across the wider world. And we had to use research strategies suited to those topics. Once we looked for those broader connections, they were everywhere. More within Hong Kong and overseas, though, than towards the mainland, except in 1912 and in 1949 to 50, when mainland politics, as we'll see, had a major impact on the trams. The story Hong Kong trams begins in 1881 with the first legislation authorizing bids to build a tram. Significantly, that legislation said that the trams could be powered by horses, steam engines, or electricity. And so did the reauthorization of that legislation in 1901. Um, for various reasons, it was hard at first to find investors, so the original authorization led to nothing, except for the peak tram, which served a wealthy clientele, had no obvious competition, and attracted enough investment to open by 1888. And when we look around the world at the turn of the century, we see that the choice between electricity and horsepower was not as obvious then as it might seem to us now. People have, of course, used horses for transportation for millennia. People also knew that it was much more efficient for horse-drawn wagons to go along tracks than along roads. And by 1800, horse and mule carts hauled freight along tracks in many, many settings. But urban horse tramps for people came along much more slowly, often because of right-of-way conflicts with other road users. London didn't get horse-drawn trams until 1870, for instance. So horse trams didn't seem old in 1881, and many of them, in fact, lasted into the teens or 20s. The world's first electric tram line didn't open until 1887, uh, either in Richmond, Virginia, or Frankfurt, Germany, we listened to. And there were various uncertainties about how to use this relatively new power source. In Hong Kong, for instance, tram construction was delayed for quite a while by disputes over whether electricity running through the overhead power lines for the trams might interfere with nearby telegraph and telephone. Ironically, one powerful argument for electricity wasn't that horse-powered transit was becoming obsolete, but instead, the argument was that its continued growth posed looming problems. As railroads and steamships transformed 19th century life, the quantities of people and freight in motion soared. And they all had to get to and from the rail stations, what transportation planners like to call the last mile problem. For that, horses remain the technology of choice. So their numbers actually exploded during a period when you might think they were starting to decline. Um, in major US cities, for instance, the number of teamsters, people who drove horse teams, 
grew more than twice as fast as the general population between 1870 and 1900. And my students love hearing this. At the first International Conference on Urban Planning held in London in 1894, the number one problem discussed was what to do about what everyone assumed would be a continually growing, very expensive, and increasingly unmanageable manure disposal problem. London's own projections for that conference were that its horse population would keep growing until it would finally peak in the 1950s. They thought that maybe by then some other transportation would come along. But since electric trams didn't contribute to the manure problem, they represented the environmentally friendly approach, even though the electricity they used mostly came from coal. Now, because a lot about electricity remained unknown at the time, and computing power still depended on humans with pencils, many technical questions about trams couldn't be modeled. They had to be resolved based on experience somewhere else. And that strengthened reliance on networks of experts. For instance, the argument I mentioned earlier about how much distancing and insulation would be needed to prevent overhead power lines from messing up telegraph and telephone signals in Hong Kong was decided by looking at what had worked in Cape Town and Calcutta. Nobody had the math to know why certain things worked. They just knew that they did. And for many years, the Hong Kong tram's technical and managerial personnel mostly came from overseas, usually being people who had done similar work in other cities under British influence. Only after World War II did a lot of those technical positions start to be filled by local people. And even then, progress was relatively slow. By contrast, ownership switched into the hands of Hong Kongers much more quickly. The company was originally headquartered in London, and most of the initial investors and directors were based there. But that changed rapidly. The company moved to Hong Kong in 1914, though it retained a UK registration, and its shareholder lists are in the Foreign and Colonial Office archives in London. By 1920, the vast majority of shareholders had Hong Kong addresses, and about a third of them, holding roughly 40% of the stock, were ethnically Chinese. Now, a bare list of names, addresses, and occupations, which is all you find in the archives, doesn't tell you that much. Not, for instance, why these particular investors decided to buy tramway shares. This is what looks like as you can see, most of the lists are handwritten, which drove me crazy, but so it goes. But we could at least Google the names of some of the bigger investors. And then there were some names that were instantly recognizable as important figures in 20th century Hong Kong. There were only about 600 shareholders at any one time, and even a little bit of digging showed how many of them were involved in other important things, and how often those activities connected them to each other. Some of the major investors in the 1920s included Robert Hotong, a man of mixed Chinese and Dutch Jewish ancestry, who was a major financial backer of China's 1911 revolution, close friend of Sun Yat-sen, and also heavily involved here in Hong Kong with the Donghua Hospital, with HKU, and with a number of other major HK institutions, including the big cemetery on the other side of Mount Davis. He was somebody in whose younger days had worked for both Jardine Matheson and the Chinese Maritime Customs. Another of these important investors was a man named Joseph Whittlesey Noble. And his story really, somebody needs to figure, it, figure out more of the details. He's originally a dentist from the United States who somehow became the dentist for the Qing royal family in Beijing, for which he was richly rewarded. And then he became, he left Beijing, moves to Hong Kong and becomes a businessman, investing in Hong Kong Electric, China Power and Light, and above all, 
the South China Morning Post, which he rescued from bankruptcy in the early 1900s and turned around completely. Other big investors included members of the Legislative Council, several directors of Donghua Hospital, Jockey Club, and other major institutions. One particularly interesting figure who reminds us that Hong Kong was not just Anglos on one side and Chinese on the other. It's a man named Paul Chater, an Armenian entrepreneur who came to Hong Kong from Calcutta as a young man in 1864 and became involved in a remarkable number of important Hong Kong undertakings. Chater was the co-founder of Dairy Farm and also a founder of the Hong Kong Electric Company. He played a major role in the Praia Land Reclamation Project, which created about 60 acres of new land along the waterfront in Central. Land which, by the way, became more valuable once there was a tramway running by it. He also founded the real estate company, Kowloon Wharf and Godown, which later became Wharf Holdings. About 90 years after its founding, Wharf bought Hong Kong Tramways, ran it from 1974 to 2009, and then sold the trams to their current owner while keeping a lot of the real estate. Chater wasn't just a businessman. He also served for 34 years as the chairman of the board of the Jockey Club. Other things. And then this is one of these little details that I find really interesting. 35 years after he came to Hong Kong, Chater sponsored five young Armenians who also came from Calcutta to Hong Kong. In fact, on the same boat that he had taken. All of them started out as postal inspectors, jobs which Chater seems to have arranged, but then left to go into business. At least two of them later also became big investors in the Hong Kong Tramways Company and among Hong Kong's biggest merchants, including the city's largest diamond dealer. And one gets a sense from all of this and more of how important personal connections were in colonial Hong Kong and how often those connections ran across both the for-profit and non-profit sectors. Personal connections of a different sort were probably vital to some of the smallest shareholders on this list, several of whom list personal service of some sort, made, ama, et cetera, as their personal occupation. You see one such person on the list here. Since company shares weren't cheap and didn't trade publicly, I think we have to assume that these people got theirs through their employers, whether as gifts, part of their compensation, for instance, as a final bonus on leaving a family once the children were grown, or simply by being introduced to somebody willing to sell. In the short time that we had to put this exhibit together, we weren't able to trace any of these connections specifically, but it shouldn't be impossible in principle by, for instance, entering the addresses that you see here for shareholders into a database and then cross-checking where these domestic servants lived against the homes of the bigger investors. My guess is that you're going to find that most of them probably list the same address as some much more wealthy person. It becomes easier to go beyond mapping connections and get at people's thoughts, which of course is what historians usually want to do eventually when we have events, got press coverage. And there are two particularly dramatic ones involving the tramways, the boycott of 1912-1913 and the strike of 1949-50. Both were heavily influenced by mainland politics and by the fears of the British authorities that mainland radicalism would destabilize Hong Kong. So the 1912 boycott was rooted in practices that actually predated the trams. The Qing government mint in Guangzhou, which originally only made copper coins, which was the main currency for ordinary people in China at the time, began making silver ones in the late 19th century, partly due to China's increasing involvement in global trade. 
But the mint was never fully funded nor tightly controlled by Beijing. And so one of the ways that they made ends meet was by underweighting their coins. The Hong Kong mint, on the other hand, made full-bodied coins. They were kept to very strict standards, but they didn't make enough of them. So it became quite profitable to send Guangzhou silver dollars to Hong Kong if you could get people to accept them at full value. And then to bring Hong Kong coins back to Guangzhou, where you could melt them down and make roughly $14 out of every 13. And lots and lots of people got involved in this. Uh, here you see a cartoon um, in a satirical Hong Kong newspaper um, sort of highlighting this problem. Obviously, Hong Kong merchants preferred getting Hong Kong coins, and some of them rejected mainland. But the tramways and the star ferry, where ticket sellers often needed to process lots of purchases quickly to move the line along, wound up getting a lot of mainland coins. Meanwhile, the government said that they couldn't really stop people from bringing the coins in. But since the coins were not legal tender, it was up to the merchants to, re to reject them. These pressures grew during 1912, after the revolution that brought down the Qing and installed the Chinese Republic. The colonial government in Hong Kong was hostile to the new provincial government in Guangdong, seeing it as socially radical and fiscally irresponsible. Meanwhile, business slumped in Hong Kong as political instability nearby was reducing trade with the mainland, and this left many merchants in no mood to reject any coins, full-bodied or not. Meanwhile, many Hong Kong residents were excited by the fall of the Qing and the establishment of a Chinese-led republic. It's hard to tell how deep those sentiments were, but when a rumor had swept Hong Kong in November 1911 that the Qing had abdicated a couple of months before they actually did, there were huge parades and celebrations that broke out sort of spontaneously in the streets. So that's a pretty good indication of enthusiasm, I'd say. So when the tramways stopped accepting mainland coins in November 1912, many people were triply offended. They resented having to pay with Hong Kong coins, since that was effectively a fair increase. They were inconvenienced by the fact that there were, just weren't enough Hong Kong coins around. And they felt that the tramways suddenly cracking down on a practice that they had always tolerated under the Qing was an insult to the new nationalist, ethnically Chinese government. And we actually know that the Hong Kong government was trying to financially weaken the Guangdong government. They either hoped to bring it down or to force it into such difficult circumstances that it would have to change its policies in return for a British loan. So banning mainland coins actually was part of that effort, whether or not the company knew it. At any rate, anger about this led to a tram boycott beginning in late November 1912. The movement seems to have been largely spontaneous, though some merchant groups who made money off of currency arbitrage and also supported the revolution did encourage the boycott once it got started. So did some other groups like rickshaw drivers who competed with the trams and were glad to see people boycotting them. People stuck with the boycott for roughly two months, even though 1912 to 13 was an unusually rainy winter and walking to work must have been pretty miserable. People had in many cases actually moved further away from their jobs to take advantage of the fact that there were now these affordable trams. If you're then stuck walking in the rain, you're not happy. Some people felt so strongly about this that when the company and some of the workers tried to keep the trams running, a number of the trains were surrounded by angry crowds. One such crowd on November 25th was reported to have had over a thousand people in it. Stones were thrown at passengers, workers, 
tramps themselves. The stalemate continued through December and early January. Some trams ran with police protection, but most were almost empty. Meanwhile, the government enacted something called the Boycott Ordinance that put tremendous pressure on the protesters. It made it a crime to commit, quote, any act calculated to persuade or induce any persons not to make use of or occupy any movable property in any lawful manner or not to work for any persons in a lawful manner. So it's pretty clearly tailored directly for the tramways boycott. But the wording was so broad that it included not only physically blocking trams or tracks, but it also banned peaceful pro-boycott speech, because that too was trying to induce people to not use the trams. The ordinance also empowered the government to declare any part of the city a so-called boycott area and levy a special tax on that area, essentially a collective fine on all its residents. On January 4th, the colonial governor declared most of the areas along the tram's routes to be boycott areas, and he gave them 12 days to solve the matter before the special levies would begin. Chinese merchants in these areas, who would have paid most of these costs, began to push for the boycott to end, while also persuading the company to sell them some slightly discounted tram tickets that they could use to lure riders back. By the end of January, the boycott had petered out, and in early February, the boycott ordinance was canceled. Now, this is one of those relatively rare cases where even though we have very few documents written by ordinary people expressing political views, their actions make it pretty clear what they were thinking. Right? It was a sacrifice to not ride the trams, but they did it, so they must have felt strongly about it. Certain symbolic acts confirm those sentiments. There was, for instance, a big display of Republican flags in Hong Kong on New Year's Day 1913, right in the middle of the boycott. On the other hand, it's very hard to know what the company's thinking is. And it may, in fact, have been a relatively passive participant in these events. It was the governor who pushed them to stop accepting mainland coins, and the governor who came up with the strategy that broke the boycott, relying heavily on government coercion. In fact, even many colonial office officials back in London thought the boycott ordinance was excessively harsh since it punished whole neighborhoods for an action not riding the trams that only some people were undertaking, and which was also, in fact, perfectly legal, right? It's no crime to decide not to ride the tram. But in an environment of political instability, the colonial government tended to assume that what was at least partly a pretty mundane issue as I said before, rejecting mainland coins was like imposing a sudden fare increase. But the government saw it as a movement that aimed to subvert the Hong Kong government and reacted on that basis, acting pretty repressively. Similar patterns appear if we fast forward to the tramway's other big political crisis, the 1949 to 50 tram strike set against the background of the emerging Cold War. The years following World War II were years of high inflation worldwide, as economies took a while to readjust to peacetime patterns of demand. And in Hong Kong, this was made much worse by a terrible housing shortage, fueled first by the return of people who had fled the Japanese occupation and then came back after 45, and then by an even bigger influx of people fleeing the Chinese Civil War, 1946 to 49. On the day World War II ended, the population of Hong Kong was about half a million. By 1951, it was 2.2 million. So it quadrupled in about five years. Wage increases generally lagged behind price increases. 
so workers fell further behind. And at the tramways, in fact, wages didn't change at all from 46 to 49. At the same time, the huge number of immigrants overwhelmed the government's limited social services, particularly education. There were not nearly enough places in government-funded primary schools, and most people couldn't afford private ones. This situation sparked two movements. One involved people from all classes, including the very highest, and focused on expanding social services, particularly education, and to some extent, housing. The government more or less cooperated with these people, at least for a while, though they increasingly turned against them in 49 and the early 50s. The other movement was a labor movement that focused on raising wages and was largely driven by the workers themselves, though it also received some support from some Hong Kong elites and more significant support from pro-communist activists, some of whom came to Hong Kong specifically for this purpose. This was, in fact, the peak of labor militancy in post-war Hong Kong's history. If you calculate the number of date, the number of person days of strike activity per thousand workers in Hong Kong. The average for 1946 to 1950 is 25 times the average for 1950 to 1989. So you get a sense of how atypical this period was. Now, most of those big numbers actually reflected strikes at a few big employers, especially public utility companies and the docks, plus, for some reason, dairy farm. And these were all places with large concentrations of workers and relatively low turnover, so that workers got to know each other pretty well, facilitating organizing. Those kinds of workplaces were also more likely to become strongholds of the pro-CCP Federation of Trade Unions, as opposed to the pro-nationalist trade union council. The two activist movements that I've mentioned, the sort of the schools movement and the labor movement did overlap, especially through organizations creating new schools for workers' children and some night schools for the workers themselves. But the collaboration was fragile and the government worked to undermine it. The two month strike by tramway workers from December 49 to February 50, involved the largest number of workers, and it was a big moment in the fracturing and ultimate defeat of these movements. But in the documents that we have, which may tell only part of the story, the Tramways Company itself once again seems fairly passive, except that one crucial moment. They mostly seem to have been kind of swept along with events. So the movement to create additional schools for workers' children had broad social support, including a lot of leading figures in the law, nonprofit leadership, the Christian clergy, and some business people, Chinese, Anglo, and Eurasian. One of them, the lawyer, um, Lo Man Kam, was chairman of the board of Donghua Hospital and of the Hong Kong Society for the Protection of Children, and a member of the University of Council at HKU, among a number of other roles. He was also, interestingly, the brother and former law partner of Lo Man Wai, who was a director of the Hong Kong Tramways. Another advocate for these worker schools was the Anglican Bishop of Hong Kong, a man named Ronald Hall. If I had more time, I would talk about a lot. He's a pretty interesting figure. Others were directors of everything from Hong Kong Power and Light to HKU. But the grassroots leadership of the individual schools, and especially of the night schools for the workers themselves, came more from the labor movement than its allies, including quite a few people who were sympathetic to or members of the CCP. Up through about the middle of 1948, these groups worked together reasonably well and created schools that accommodated perhaps 20,000 students. 
though this still met only a fraction of the need. But after that, with the CCP gaining ground on the mainland and a new hardline Hong Kong governor, Alexander Grantham, the education department started pushing harder for these schools to eliminate personnel and activities that the government associated with CCP propaganda. When schools didn't do this or did it too slowly, the government began closing a number of them, replacing them with new government-run ones, though often only a few years later. Many of the grassroots people involved in these schools were either deported or fled before being deported. This included, among other people, the head of the School for Tramway Workers' Children, a woman named Li Xiaxiang, who again is a pretty interesting character. She's a Hong Kong-born CCP member who had fled to the mainland during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong in World War II, and then was sent back in 1945 by the party to organize in the city. And as I said, she winds up as head of a school for tramway workers' children. Some similar patterns, you might be wondering why I spend all this time talking about this movement to create schools for workers' children. And one of the reasons is that very similar patterns show up when we look at labor politics per se, including the tramway strike. Labor activism in 46 to 48 attracted many sympathizers and some concessions from smaller employers and from the government, such as agreeing to subsidize rice for workers in key industry. But there were no major breakthroughs. Meanwhile, citywide union leadership increasingly shifted towards people with pro-CCP sympathies, mirroring the party's gains on the mainland during this time. During the summer and fall of 49, a group of the unions at the big strategic firms that I mentioned, particularly utilities, settled on an identical set of wage demands, indicating coordination among them. And these demands would have raised the earnings of the lowest paid tramway workers by close to 90%. Employers all rejected these demands and made fairly similar counteroffers, suggesting that they were also coordinating amongst themselves. The one from the tramway company was basically a 30% increase for the poorest workers as opposed to 90%. And then the government put its thumb on the scale by forbidding strikes by workers in essential public services, which covered most of these workers. But the tramway workers thought they had a way around this, which fit with their particular work conditions, and so suddenly put them at the absolute center of the conflict. They announced that starting on December 24th, they would keep the trams running, so they were not violating the government's rule against a strike of an essential service, but they would, stop, um, they would stop collecting fares, arguing that collecting fares is not an essential public service. It's keeping the trams running that's an essential public service. But of course, if they didn't collect fares, running the trams would be very costly to the company and pressure them to settle. It's only then, when the company faced losing the government protection that the other public utilities had, that it took action, locking out the recalcitrant ticket takers on December 28th and announcing that it would also sack everyone else if things didn't promptly return to normal. From that point on, things escalated quickly. The workers, no longer receiving either wages or subsidized rice, needed aid. They got quite a bit of it from Guangdong. The government, pointing to this cross-border support, took an increasingly hard line against what they said was communist interference in Hong Kong. And previously sympathetic elites mostly backed away from supporting the workers. This escalating spiral of hostility peaked in a violent clash between police and strike supporters on January 30th followed by a bunch of arrests. Some union supporters 
um, then publicly called on Mao Zedong to intervene. Though there is no evidence whatsoever that the CCP ever considered that. Deportations of some arrested union leaders followed. And just 10 days later, workers voted to accept an offer from the company. It was pretty much the same as what they had been offered months ago. A bit later, the company announced that it would no longer recognize the FTU affiliated Tramway Workers Union, but instead would recognize a different politically conservative one. From then on, workers were divided between the two, greatly weakening their bargaining power. And you probably can't, the type is too small probably for you to see this here, but this is the free newspaper put out by the leftist Tramway Workers Union. And it's, it's the June 1st, 1950 issue. So it's significantly after the strike. And the fascinating thing is that they're trying to spin the whole thing as a huge victory, when in fact they had basically lost. Thus, the story of the strike looks very different if we take it in isolation, focusing on the viewpoints of the workers and the company per se, in which case it does look like a wage dispute with the government coming in near the end on the side of management. Or if we look at it instead in the context of early Cold War politics in the city more generally. From that perspective, the material conflicts between workers and management get submerged in a larger set of conflicts in which the government moved to isolate or eliminate pro-CCP activists, to mobilize labor, and then deal with some of the grievances that had prompted the workers' movements through top-down settlements and concessions. Now, interestingly, for the tramway company in particular, this meant that during the 50s, they significantly expanded workers' medical, dental, and other benefits. The wages remained pretty low. The most innovative thing they did was building lots of subsidized housing for workers, something in which the company was a real pioneer. The only Hong Kong company I know of that built extensive subsidized housing for ordinary workers before the tramways did was Taiku Sugar Refund. And they were kind of a special case because their refinery was way the heck out. If you wanted the workers there early in the morning, they had to live nearby. Now, this was all way before the Hong Kong government was building social housing on a really large scale. And so that made the company housing especially valuable. Moreover, the company also created other benefits to help make the housing attractive such as subsidizing new schools nearby. The combination of new benefits on the one hand and suppression of the old union on the other helped create labor peace at the company from the 1950s on. And the 50s and early 60s were generally years of stability, steady growth, and we think, though we don't have the records, solid profitability for the tram. What put a lid on that growth was something that the company had no control over, and that was the spread of new forms of transportation, which led to ridership stagnating and then gradually declining in the mid-1960s on. Another factor here is that although the population of Hong Kong kept growing, the population of Hong Kong Island has actually grown very little since the 1950s. And since the company's repeated bids to get into light rail or other transit operations in Kowloon and the new territories kept getting turned down, again, for reasons that are not entirely clear. Here's one of the proposals that never happened. But this meant that the company's revenues were very much tied to the island itself. It's in this context that real estate development became central to the company's strategy. Like many other things we've discussed, this actually reflected global patterns of change. Throughout the post-war world, technological and social changes have cut into the profitability of older transportation technologies with the spread of private automobiles, 
providing particularly stiff competition to local trams, buses, and commuter rails, while airplanes and again cars have cut into the profits of the operators of long distance buses and trains. Under these circumstances, many transport companies found that the best source of new revenue was the real estate underneath their downtown terminals. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, this trend took off first in the auto and suburb crazy United States. In New York, for instance, the opening of the government operated Port Authority bus terminal in 1950 allowed a whole bunch of companies to consolidate terminal facilities and sell terminals that they used to have elsewhere in the city. And in almost every US city, railroads and long distance bus companies like Greyhound either sold their old terminals outright, switching to outdoor bus stops, or sold the air rights above their terminals so that people could build high density buildings. Um, turns out I did a little bit of research on this while I was doing the talk. The most Greyhound station, bus stations that remain in the United States are actually now owned by hedge funds. Similar trends soon hit various other countries. So it was very much part of a global trend when the tramways were acquired by the real estate company Wharf Holdings in the 1970s. And Wharf then closed a bunch of downtown activities, not just terminal space, but maintenance facilities and nearby worker housing. And the housing was also less valuable to workers than it used to be because the government started to build more social housing from the 70s on. So they closed these things, they moved operations to smaller and or cheaper sites, and they put the land up for redevelopment. The biggest project of this sort was Times Square in Causeway Bay, built on the site of an old maintenance facility. This is a case where without access to internal company records, we can't see the strategy taking place. But the logic is so clear. And the fact that so many other firms facing declining ridership found a similar logic compelling gives us confidence in the interpretation. We know what's going on. But for all the ways in which the tramway story reflects larger networks, movements, and trends, what might be the central fact about the Hong Kong tramways? which is their continued relevance, is actually unusual. In a world in which numerous tram systems have either been dismantled or become totally marginal, San Francisco's cable cars, for instance, remain a strong tourist attraction, but they carry less than 15,000 people a day, total drop in the bucket. Hong Kong tramways carry about 140,000 a day, big difference. The resilience of the tramways, as the exhibit emphasizes, reflects the company's adaptability in an environment in which many planners and pundits have repeatedly pre predicted that the trams were about to become obsolete. The ability to adapt and to do so without needing massive new investment or official assistance has been another consistent theme in the tramway's history one that isn't part of any broader pattern, but represents a very particular achievement that now, with our rediscovery of the virtues of sustainability, really makes it the tramways worthy of renewed attention. This is, among other things, almost pollution-free transportation. In other words, the trams are a lens that shows us webs of connection and far-reaching patterns but they're also something special and unique. And I hope that the exhibit shows you all of those angles and more. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, let's take a few questions from the audience here in the room. Yes. How would you compare this with the building of the transcontinental railway in the United States or the building of the high-speed rail in China in the 21st century? Hey, that's interesting because um, cutting edge technology 
actually is not always the most profitable thing to do. And so the transcontinental railroad in the United States, for instance, very clearly was cutting edge technology. Uh, a lot of the engineering was spectacular at the time. Um, and it made an enormous difference to the development of the United States. It would never have been profitable without government subsidies. Um, in fact, there's a wonderful book about, called Railroaded by the Stanford historian Richard White, which he shows in great detail that, yeah, the Transcontinental Railroad was an enormous long-term benefit, but it, didn't, it wasn't actually economical for the most part until about 30 years after it was built. Worse yet, because the government was subsidizing it, it was ridiculously overbuilt. And in fact, there wasn't just one transcontinental railroad, but there were multiple lines built through these depopulated parts of the American West on the assumption that someday people, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. The problem is if you build it through parts of Utah with no water, no, they won't come. <laughs> and um, the US government just shelled out incredible amounts of money for this thing. Um, the tramways, on the other hand, as I said, have generally functioned without government assistance. And in fact, at times there seems to have been a certain amount of government hostility. Um, as I said, there Proposals for expansion kept getting turned down. Um, and at various moments, planners actually said, you know, these are obsolete. We should ditch them. You know, we should just have a wider roadway and make more space for cars. A lot of people predicted with that when the MTR Island line was built, the tramways would be completely pointless. Um, you know, they continue to. We don't know how much money they make or lose. Um, and that just, so, as I said, real estate has become more and more important to sustaining the company. But they clearly still do service function, right? There are lots. Yes, tourists love them. But it's not just tourists, right? That 140,000 riders a day is a lot more than tourists. Um, High-speed rail in China is complicated again. And it's harder to get the kind of data that we have for the US railways. So I'm going to leave that part of your question aside, I'm afraid. Um, How about on this side? Yes. So, uh, I have seen uh, you have uh, shared a free uh, page of slides about the uh, protest and the, uh, the workers' strike. Uh, so, uh, may you uh, roll back to the first page of uh, protest and workers' strike? Yeah, so I have a problem on the page. Uh, I have a question on the page. Um, just tell me when I get to the one you like. Uh, uh, one more page back. Yeah, this one. So, uh, so for change on the front row. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, during the 1940 line, is there any uh, work pipes uh, yet or uh, still peaceful? Okay, so in this picture, as you can see, nothing in particular is happening. This just gives you a sense of what the trams were like in 49. Um, there was considerable tension building all through 1949, largely because, as I said, the workers' wages were falling further and further behind the cost of living. Um, and there were attempts to organize of various sorts. Um, then in the summer, basically, the government on the one hand announced a subsidy program for rice for workers in so-called strategic um, occupations, including public utilities. And then on the other hand said, but we forbid strikes um, of workers in these strategic um, occupations. And that kind of kept an uneasy but unhappy peace for a while. Um, it's quite clear that there was a lot of discontent but people couldn't quite figure out a way around the fact that the government had basically forbidden them to strike. So there were protests, but it wasn't until the tramway workers thought that they'd found a way around the strike prohibition by saying, okay, we won't strike, but we won't collect fares. Um, that was what really made the tramways rather than say the electric company 
the center of the whole conflict. And that was that what then led to the company saying, well, if you do that, we're going to lock you out. And then, of course, if you're no longer employed in a strategic industry because you've been locked out, you lose your rice subsidy. When you lose your rice subsidy and your wages were not very high to begin with, you become dependent on people helping you, which in many cases turned out to be people across the border in Guangdong, which then leads the government to say, aha, we were right all along. This is a communist plot. Um, in fact, if you read the uh, minutes of the British cabinet in late 49, early 50, you can see that in the cabinet itself, they are arguing about hey, is this basically a wage dispute? In which case, the British government should stand back and just you know, let labor and management work it out, maybe provide a mediator, but that's that. Or is this a case of communist subversion? In which case, you know, are the communists trying to cause strikes in major utilities, paralyze Hong Kong, and make it ripe for a takeover? You know, and of course, in... The atmosphere of 1949, 1950, people are nervous. And basically the hardliners win and convince, well, Grantham, the colonial governor, didn't need, need much convincing because he was one of the hardest of the hardliners. But basically the cabinet, the hardliners in the cabinet win and say, okay, if Grantham really wants to crack down, let him crack down. But they themselves were divided because they weren't sure um, what the nature of this movement was. Um, unfortunately, this is one of the limits of our sources. The minutes of the cabinet meetings only present the conclusions that each side took. So you can't find out from them what, you know, what evidence they had. So you know, the people who said, this is just a wage dispute, what was their evidence? The people who said it's, the, it's communist subversion, what was their evidence? The problem, as a British historian colleague of mine explained to me, is that cabinet minute meetings can be requested and publicized by members of parliament. So nobody's ever going to talk in a cabinet, in the cabinet minutes, about things like, well, intelligence sources say that, blah, blah, blah. For that, we'd have to get a different set of documents, and we were not able to get those at the time. Couple questions from the Zoom audience. Uh, Ken, I'm going to merge two things together. One person asked about the tram and how it facilitated economic development. I think we talked about some of that with real estate, shopping malls, and so on. But they asked whether that significance is being reduced. And then pertaining to the income streams, revenue streams of the tramway, um, this idea that uh, they're making more money on advertising than on actual uh, ridership and they were asking if you had any information about that. Okay, so for the first part of it, the tramway is definitely, I mean, simply by making it easier to get around the city, they stimulated economic activity, right? They made it possible for workers to live further from their jobs um, and thereby facilitated development in other places. Um, they made it much easier for people especially poorer people, to get to entertainment on the weekends. Um, so the, well, in addition to the line that runs along the coast, the tramways also has a line that goes up to Happy Valley. And so they did a lot of promotions during racing season. They also did a lot of promotions in the early days to draw people to the beaches, um, including paying for performances of bands and puppet shows for the kids and so on and so forth. And so they changed actually the leisure practices of the population, right? They, a lot of people who would do it, who if they had had to walk, would have said, you know, the beach is just way too far, um, especially when it's hot. Now, oh yeah, I could do that. And so the trams did have all sorts of stimulatory effect on the economy in different ways. Obviously, that is reduced today because they're now fairly small percentage of the traffic. 
the advertising stuff, that's, that's an astute point because one of the things, as the tram, I'm, I talked about real estate as one way that the tramways made up for declining ridership. But another thing they realized is that a relatively slow moving tram is a great vehicle for advertising, right? Um, if you want to get to where you're going fast, you use the MTR, right? But the MTR runs underground. <laughs> if, right, a tram is highly visible, it moves slow enough that you can see all the ads, um, and that has become a big part of revenue. The other thing is that not only can everybody see the trams, but the people on the trams can see everything. And so the trams are attractive to tourists and attractive to Hong Kongers doing leisure things. So party trams have become a significant part of the company's revenue, right? Organizations lease the tram, a tram for a day and the their, the members of their organization or their workers, if it's a company, get to do what they want. Um, sometimes, you know, as those of you who live here will know, sometimes, you know, people or organizations sponsor the trams for a day. So everybody gets free fares and the tram then has all this stuff on it saying, you know, your, these free fares are made possible by such and such a company or by the fan club of a particular pop star or, you know, you name it. Um, so the company has been quite inventive about finding ways to get revenue out of the trams, even though their ridership is now, well, just before COVID, it was about 140,000 a day, whereas it peaked in the 1960s at about 530, 540,000 a day. So that's a pretty big decline. But they have managed to continue to keep it a going concern. Okay. Um, any qu other questions in the audience? Yes. To know if the tram system was affected by the Japanese occupation in World War II at all. Yeah. So the, the Japanese attitude towards Hong Kong was basically that it didn't really fit into their plans. And they put zilch resources into Hong Kong. Um, so trams that broke down were not repaired. Um, the track itself was not repaired. On VJ Day, so the, there were 109 tram cars on the day the Japanese invaded. On VJ Day, 15 of those 109 were in working order. And one of the stories I didn't have time to tell, um, but that I think is a really interesting story, is how quickly they got the trams back up running again in 45, 46. Um, and part of the story is there was one particular um, sort of middle manager who had kept very, he'd made tremendous efforts to track down tramway workers. Because as I mentioned, lots of people left the city under the Japanese occupation. And the Japanese didn't mind that because as I said, the city was never a priority for them. Their hub in the Southeast region was basically Taiwan, which had been their colony for years. Um, so they were perfectly happy with people leaving Hong Kong. And some people did leave, including a lot of tramway employees. And this one guy, whose name, unfortunately, I've forgotten, um, just made incredible efforts to track down tramway workers and you know, try to give them incentives to come back and take back their old jobs. Um, meanwhile, the British, um, their side of the, of the success story was that they got the electricity running up remarkably fast because the Japanese had basically trashed power plants as well. Um, so you had your power, you had your workers, they repaired the track. And one benefit of this for the tramways company, I mentioned before that periodically there have been planners and pundits who said, oh, the tramways are outdated. We should get rid of them. 
Well, in 47, the British commissioned, uh, well, commissioned a commission to study transportation for the city post-war period. And a lot of people on that commission were inclined to say, tramways are outdated. Um, we should be investing in something else instead. But the company had already put so much um, capital into restoring the trams that the British were basically presented with a fait accompli, sort of, hey, you know, are you really going to walk away from this thing, which is now in tip-top shape at a time when very little else in the city was in tip-top shape? So it may be that that rapid recovery after the war actually saved the trams from being replaced by a wider roadway or something like that. Maybe one last question here in the audience. Thank you. Professor, thanks for mentioning that's the reason for the, uh, rejecting the plans to expand in like Kowloon or the New Jersey. Uh, the reasons were unclear, but is there any clue or hints? Um, the only clue that I have seen and it only applies to one plan. So there was one particular proposal for expansion. I think it was in 28 that the government turned down and they said that they wanted instead to give a concession to a bus company. And there were two reasons that they gave at the time. One was that they thought that buses were the wave of the future. The other, interestingly enough, was that the bus company was Chinese. And at that moment, 1928, right after the Kuomintang had Northern Expedition, et cetera, et cetera, the British were trying to make nice with Chinese nationalists. And so they thought that giving a bus concession to a Chinese company was better than giving a tram concession to what was still, still seen as a British company, because even though a lot of the investors by this were Chinese and most of the employees were Chinese, top management was still mostly Anglo. But that's the only case in which I have any evidence at all. Um, something like this 1919 plan that I showed you I have no idea why it was rejected. Interestingly, one of the big backers of that plan was this guy, Paul Chater, that I mentioned before. Um, he had his finger in everything. And he was pushing that and actually had bought a bunch of land near the terminal that was supposed to be a terminal in Kowloon. So one of the few cases where he didn't win. Well, thank you so much, Professor Pomerantz. Please uh, give Professor Pomerantz a round of applause. That was fantastic. I just need to close out for our Zoom audience. Um, first of all, I would like to, um, well, thank Professor Pomerantz. That was really incredible. And um, it's been such a pleasure working with him on our campus here. He is really one of the top University of Chicago faculty. So we're extremely fortunate to have him working with our team here in Hong Kong. Um, I'd also like to uh, congratulate Hong Kong Tramways for 120th uh, year anniversary this year in uh, 2024. So congratulations to the tramway. Um, for those of you on Zoom who haven't seen the exhibition yet, I just wanted to remind you that the, uh, the exhibition called Tram Tales 120 years of Hong Kong tramways. The exhibition is open um, through May 24th. So May 24th is when that exhibition will end this year. And the other exhibition, if you haven't seen it, uh, called Daughters of the Canton Delta, which we opened and had a program on uh, about three weeks ago, uh, it will be open till March 31st of this year. So um, please join us uh, and come and visit those two exhibitions. Uh, we'll be making this recording available online. So if you have friends who are interested in this history of Hong Kong trams, uh, we put all of our programs on our YouTube channel for people to enjoy later on. And then um, the other thing, last but not least, uh, I always like to talk about the course podcast, which you may or may not be familiar with. It's our very own 
podcast that we do here in Hong Kong. Uh, we actually like to feature and talk about our uh, U Chicago faculty. And uh, so we uh, had in the season one, we had a hundred episodes of the course podcast featuring our faculty. Uh, Ken was the first uh, on that. Uh, and it was really interesting to hear your background, Ken, on the course. Um, we really, we, we, the course is all about talking about the path that our faculty took to become professors. And the stories are really unique and really diverse. And um, I think you'll enjoy listening to that program. Um, so really that's all I had is to share with you uh, a little bit about the course, uh, about our upcoming exhibitions. Season two is uh, underway with the course podcast. Judith Zeidlin, one of Ken's uh, uh, faculty colleagues in um, East Asian studies uh, is I think being released this week. So if you check out the course, you'll be able to see Judith um, who's actually in China now uh, doing some of her own research. So you can find uh, the course on Apple and Spotify, Simalaya in, in the mainland, and uh, all your favorite podcast uh, platforms. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody who came here in person tonight and thank all the people who are on Zoom, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Gongxi Pa Tsai.